This was Flint Albertson, one of the many predominant scientists in the Flies of Souls 2 investigation. He gained notable fame after his anti-fly killing campaign, which was ironically named after his father's pest control company. The Souvenirs de Parasite stands today as a poignant reminder of the hardships and wars endured by many, a testament to the resilience of those who fought for their unwavering beliefs. While this may be the case, Flint Albertson, however, is both favored and unfavored by many. Some refer to him as Abraham Lincoln's duplication, while others denounce this and refer to him as a fascist individual. For example, in 2016, a magazine picture surfaced, which read, Here lies a man who had immense potential. How it pains us to know that he had started what many refer to as species segregation. This theory first adapted when Flint Albertson produced an animated article which read that flies are far more superior than humans, alerting to us the practice of anti-human propaganda. These claims were seen as highly pessimistic, or as Boshan Manure stated, this, this is, is very, very ludicrous. ludicrous. These claims would, however, attract non-biased spectators such as myself to write a full-length memoir on my experience with the great Mr. Albertson. Our story starts off in 1989. The spring bloom had just arrived. Winter's ever so dull aroma had vanished, allowing the fragrance of marigold to unfortunately be disrupted by a swarm of bees. But this was not as annoying as Mother Nature's many other offsprings. At night, there was the endless whining of mosquitoes, while during the day, houses were flooded with the disturbance of the Musca domestica. The buzz and wine plague, as I like to call it, saw a great deal of anti-insect promotional ads flooding across the streets. The use of fly swatters and bug spray had reached enormous sales while various media encouraged consumerism. Enter in the protesters. Flynn Albertson, a door-to-door -door salesman who undoubtedly had a true passion for literature but was content to a fair degree, had been unknown for a good amount of his years. He remained overshadowed by his father's overwhelming wealth and success. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my right hand gal. Send me a kiss by one. Baby, my heart's on fire. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me, and you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone and tell me I'm your own. A father of none and a husband of a nun, political thinker, bath salts user, soon to be pilgrim, mathematician denouncer, dog lover, bird watcher, and most famously, pest and insect protester. Flint Albertson adored his work as he often used his door-to-door -door salesman job to promote the awareness of pests and insects. Upon meeting him, I learned quite a great deal about him. For instance, the fact that he had studied the fly and its aspects for almost his entire life, accounting to me the days he would ponder on why humans felt the need to applaud themselves so much so that they believed that they were better than every other species. He proved his rebellious hipster side to a fair degree. I, as a fellow human, would question this, to which he would respond and say, The things most despised in this world are the same things that make humanity what it is. He said that with a jar of insects between his legs. But why the fly, you may ask? Well, Albertson often stated that out of his many studies on pests, insects, vermin, and so forth, the fly seemed to be the less dominant and aggressive. The so-called research studies claim that the fly's desperate need for attention is merely just the fly looking for ways to socialize, just like we humans ever so crave. 
Flynn Nelbertson would then solidify his argument with a poignant declaration. Every day a child is born, 10,000 flies are killed. And every time a fly meets its demise, more fly swatters and fly sprays are produced to combat their population. As we parted ways, I had a slight nudge that this wouldn't be the last time we'd see each other. Albertson would later give up his job as a door-to-door -door salesman and set his eyes upon more alerting endeavors. The Winchell Dynasty Complex, which stands at the center of a CBD and two highly praised exhibitions, a tourist attraction and a highly appreciated building, without a doubt. About 130 feet tall, which homes around 148 people. Founded in the early 1650s by Sir Theodore Winchell, it was to be demolished after 339 years, if not for the billions in the pockets of the great Boshan Manior. Boshan Manior, a wealthy son of a pharmacist and an engineer, and a former dictator who fought during the Mustache War of the 1970s, decorated the Winchell dynasty into what it is today a lavishing apartment complex for no doubt upper-class individuals. I would later gain the privilege of meeting up with him in 1987. Upon entering the well-known building, I was astonished by the courteous yet somewhat brittle manners of the employees. He is regarded as a highly stern person, referring of course to the policies that tenants including employees should adhere to once entering the building. Learning about his youthful days, I had learned that his pugnacious mindset had aided him on to become a person who was quite influential in the political spectrum. Upon gaining recognition among several political members, he had cultivated his own cult-like following that would easily do as he pleased. With his newfound wealth, Boshan Monio began to wield his financial influence in ways that surprised even himself. He started using his resources to sway high-ranking politicians like Mayor Hugh Bridick orchestrating changes that aligned with his own eccentric but heartful vision for society. First order of business, extermination of flies. Boshan Manyo had become infamous for his controversial stance on insect control. He passionately advocated for the reduction of all insects, most notably the common housefly. In one memorial interview, he stated with unwavering conviction we as anti-fly activists urge humanity to curb the fly population. We fear that in the near future, these pests may outnumber the human race. His peculiar crusade against the insect world sparked a curious movement, capturing the imagination of both supporters and skeptics alike. The revolt had begun. Hey guys, I just say I'm enthusiast here. I just wanted to quickly tell you my story if you could just spare a minute of your time. I'm a long time Boner Garage Studios campaigner. And over the years, there's been lots of ups and downs in the business. But I must say, this movement has been nothing short of a blessing. Subscribing to Just Sam has changed the way I view the world, teaching me countless unwavering lessons in life. And to be honest, this could be you too. So I highly recommend you to subscribe today. And you'll have no regrets. Just Sam Enthusiast, out. In a peculiar twist of fate, worthy of a storybook, Flynn's later years took an unexpected turn. After his father's dramatic and somewhat theoretical passing, Flynn Elbertson found himself the unlikely heir to his father's sprawling pest control empire. Gentlemen, meet your new boss. 
This inheritance, with its vintage extermination equipment, seemed more like a whimsical setting from one of his beloved novels rather than a business venture. It had aided him to turn his father's pest control company into a fly activist company which stood as a foreground for all pests and insects. Flint Elvison, now a wealthy and influential figure, was quick to respond to the upsetting news about Boshan Manure's anti-fly campaign. Determined to counteract Manure's radical movement, Flint assembled a crew of the world's greatest minds, entomologists, environmentalists, and innovative thinkers, creating a team more powerful and diverse than the likes of Boshan. With their combined expertise and Flint's newfound resources, it had become clear that a clash between the two sides was inevitable. The stage was set for an extraordinary battle of wits and ideologies, one that would put Flint Albertson's eclectic and brilliant team against the fervent and zealous followers of Boshan Manior. Once civilians caught wind of the feud between Flint Albertson and Boshan Manior, they eagerly joined the debate, turning the feud into a wildly entertaining spectacle, one that made the 90s a decade worth living for. Countless doors and buildings became their battleground for conflicts across the cities. The World Wrestling Federation even entertained the idea of hosting a wrestling match between the two of them. As cities partied wildly and drunkenly, smaller neighboring towns saw families placing bets on the outcomes of the feud. Villages and farms were no exception. Many people engaged in betting games like horse racing or haystacking to wager on the victory. And let us not forget the animals. Who's to say they didn't have their own little feud brewing up? Families and friends found themselves embroiled in their own disagreements. Some sided with Mother Nature's offspring, arguing for their right to exist, while others vehemently denounced flies, believing that they should never have been created. As tensions rose, trust amongst people began to wane. The media ever so vigilant seized upon the feud, using it to spin propaganda that only further stoked the flames of discord. Newspapers and television broadcasts painted the conflict in vivid colors, turning what started as a debate into a larger-than-life spectacle. The tension reached a boiling point after a shocking incident at the Gatwick's commercial building. An employee was gravely wounded when their boss, driven by panic and paranoia, shot them during a heated argument about the fly revolt. This tragic event ignited a wave of public outrage against Boshan Manior and the highly ranking corrupt politicians who had turned a blind eye to the growing chaos. In a world deteriorating on the brink of absurdity and brilliance, Flint and his remarkable crew stood ready to challenge the status quo, determined to bring balance and sanity back to a society embroiled in the most unexpected of battles.
A great deal of media outlets began to cover the story. Not less than a week, newspapers would surface searching for Flint Albertson's missing trio. It wouldn't take long until he would receive a warning from Boshan Manure, in a form of a telegram, writing, Dear Mr. Albertson, we have captured three of your biggest forces. Surrender now or they will succumb to a fate far worse than death. Days and nights would pass by, and it seemed as if the absurdness of this would draw to an unfavorable conclusion. Residents gathered in quine cafes and blustery markets, passionately weighing in on the ethics and implications of Albertson's theory. Even the local wildlife seemed to have a stake in the matter. As the feud between Flint Albertson and Boshan Manyu unfolded, every twist and turn became fodder for the vibrant tapestry of community life, where even the smallest details carried a touch of quirky charm and profound meaning. The revolt had a devastating effect on the economy, sparking an age of outrage. Politicians across the spectrum began to threaten to sue both Flint Albertson and Boshan Manyor if they didn't end this fiasco immediately. The chaos, however, would not unfold for too long, much to the disappointment of absurdism enthusiasts, as it led to the arrest of both Flint Albertson and Boshan Manyor. Boshan Manyor was later charged and convicted of corruption, along with Hugh Bridick and many other corrupt governing politicians. Despite these changes, Boshan Manyor managed to avoid serving any prison sentence due to alleged tempering, but was forced to withdraw from all positions relating to the Winchell dynasty complex. In the ensuing legal fallout, Flint Albertson was found guilty of inciting a riot and faced additional scrutiny due to his bath salts addiction. He and his comrades were arrested on May 12, 1994. Journalists, including myself, were forbidden to speak to either one of them for the remainder of the year. Despite this, Flint and I maintained mutual respect through a series of clandestine letters. In October 1997, the spokesman and executive of Insect Safety honored Flint Albertson for his unwavering devotion to rescuing countless insects. The president, impressed by Flint's dedication, sought ways to facilitate his release the following year. On January 15, 1998, Flint Albertson was released from prison with the stipulation that he would never incite such chaos again. His speeches and theories gained widespread acclaim and he was no longer seen as a barbarian but as a national sensation. Embracing his newfound fame, Flint sold all of his fortunes including his beloved anti-fly killing campaign and his father's buildings, viewing them as a remnant of a past he wished to leave behind promising to leave his past flaws and pains behind the bars. Flint embarked on a journey of self-reinvention. Following a profound spiritual awakening, Flint decided to become a pilgrim. During his travels, he met Claire Garden, an astounding and beautiful Catholic who would without a doubt swim in the right direction. Flint and I spent a great deal of time chattering about various nonsensical topics and entering a curious deja vu pattern each time we made each other chuckle or chortle. The sun seemed to fall early those times, casting long shadows and bathing our conversations in a warm and nostalgic glow. Thank you.
bad little boy That's what you're acting like I really don't buy That you're that kind of guy And if you are Why do you want to hang out with me? 